Dr. Graham Allison, whose topic will be U.S. national interests. Dr. Allison is the director of the Belfour Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. He is also the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government and the faculty chair of the Dubai Initiative at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Dr. Allison has served in the past as a special advisor to the Secretary of Defense under Ronald Reagan, Assistant Secretary of Defense in the first Clinton administration, member of the Defense Policy Board for Defense Secretaries including Weinberger, Carlucci, Cheney, Aspen, Curry, and, and Cohen. Obviously, Dr. Allison has been around and in very influential positions for a very long time, and he brings uh, insights into U.S. national interest, not only from the theoretical realm, but also from the very, very practical realm of U.S. government. He has been the organizer of two commissions on America's national interests. He's a founding member of the Trilateral Commission. He's a member of several public committees and commissions, including the Baker Cutler DOE Task Force on Nonproliferation Programs with Russia, and the Commission on Prevention of Weapons of Mass Destruction, Proliferation, and Terrorism. For three decades, Dr. Allison has been a leading analyst of U.S. national security and defense policy with special interests and emphasis in nuclear weapons, terrorism, and decision making, all of which issues you will see some flavor of in tonight's presentation. Dr. Allison attended Davidson College, Harvard University, and Oxford University, receiving his PhD from Harvard University. Please join with me in wel welcoming Dr. Graham Allison. Thank you much uh, for a very generous introduction. I've been told I need to move this mouse around from time to time, otherwise it dies after 10 minutes or it goes back to sleep. But in any case, uh, uh, let me say how, what a pleasure and honor it is for me to be here. I accepted the uh, invitation to come because I was impressed by the seriousness of this rethinking enterprise and intrigued by the specific assignment that was given to me to think about uh, national interests. And I've tried to take the assignment seriously and to take this as an opportunity to go back and think about a set of issues or to rethink for myself some issues about American national interest that I thought about quite hard uh, or as, as hard as I could when we were doing this Commission on American National Interest back in both 1996 and in 2000. This was an effort that was co-organized by Harvard, uh, the Rand Corporation, and the Nixon Center. And the co-executive uh, directors were uh, Jim Thompson from Rand, Dimitri Symes, and myself. Uh, Bob uh, Blackwell, my colleague, uh, who then went off in the Bush administration to be ambassador to India, and then was the deputy national security advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran uh, was the co-writer uh, with me of the 2000 report. And this commission, which I think some uh, excerpts from were in the material distributed, uh, was kind of, I would call, the same center. Okay? Uh, so it stretched from uh, Tweedledum to Tweedledee, some of you would probably say, but in any case, uh, John McCain or Pat Roberts or Condi Rice in the Republican group or Sam Nunn, Bob Graham and Paul Krugman from the Democratic side. So it was a distinguished group of Americans, thoughtful, uh, no standing except for their own uh, you know, judgment, but I think a thoughtful group of people who came together around the proposition that Americans needed to think again more clearly about American national interest, and that had the, uh, I would, I'd say it was not the presumptuousness, because actually we didn't want to presume, but we did want to, uh, in any case, state as clearly as we could what we thought were American national interests. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. 
This excerpt then tonight will draw from that commission, but will also stretch a little further as I've been trying to do some thinking uh, since. And the assignment that was given to me, let me just say what it says here, consisted of three questions. What determines national interests? Secondly, what factors and or principles are critical for prioritizing U.S. long-term national interests? And third, what trends in U.S. national interests are evident and how they're likely to change in the future? So by the time I finish my 40 minutes or so, I think you'll be pretty clear about at least what my answers are to these questions. And if not, we'll have an opportunity to discuss them and debate them. Let me uh, start here with a concrete example because I think it's always useful when talking about such abstract ideas to try to reduce them to common sense and to something concrete. So most of you uh, are familiar with the West Point speech on December 1st. President Obama announced, as Commander-in-Chief, I've determined that it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 troops to Afghanistan, blah, 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 okay? So the proposition, America has vital national interest in Afghanistan. That's what the president says. And the question is agree or alternatively disagree and why? And again, before we're done, I'll tell you at least my views. So the three big takeaways for tonight, let me just sort of signal where I'm going and then I'll tell you what my game plan is and then I'll proceed. The first takeaway or proposition is that the only sound foundation for a sustainable American foreign policy is a clear sense of American national interests. So the foundation for sustainable foreign policy is a clear sense of American national interests. Only a foreign policy grounded in American national interests can identify priorities for American engagement in the world. Only a, such a policy will allow American leaders to explain persuasively how and why American citizens should support expenditures of treasure and blood. So the first proposition, American national interest, the only sound foundation for sustainable American foreign policy. The second takeaway proposition is the hierarchy of American national interest. The hierarchy of American national interest. Clarity about American national interests demands that we, this generation, of leaders and attentive publics think harder about international affairs than we had to do during the Cold War. And I would say for the last 20 years, we've not done very well. We've not done very well. During the Cold War, we, which was for most of our professional lives, had clearer and simpler answer to the questions about American national interests. Currently, we've got to confront again questions like which regions and issues should Americans care about, or in any case, care more about than about something else. So Afghanistan, or Iraq, or Russia, or China, or the Persian Gulf. And which issues matter more than the other, other, other issues? The value of China's currency. Or weapons of mass destruction and their proliferation and maybe even loose nukes. Or international crimes and drugs and trafficking. Or climate. Or human rights. So the question why should we care? The answer is, of course, we should care about everything. But what should we care about more than about something else? A hierarchy requires that something is more important than something else. And Americans are not very good at hierarchy, and American government finds it almost impossible to do hierarchy. 
but without a sense of the hierarchy of American national interest, that is, some things matter more than other things, some, th some things we should care about more than other things, it's impossible, I believe, to have a sustainable, uh, to have a clear sense of our national interest, which is this foundation for a sustainable foreign policy. So you'll find when, we, when I go to the discussion here that the commission's uh, uh, account of national interest is very sparse compared to most discussions of this topic. And we in the commission finally, after wrestling with each other for a long time, decided how about in trying to think about this hierarchy, we divide it into four, four different columns. First column, vital. Second column, extremely important. Third column, important. Fourth column, less important. Okay. And on the fourth column, there were many things that are very important. Very important. Might even be the thing that you've devoted your life to, or that the issue that you work on, but is, quote, less important than the thing that's in the third column, which is less important than the things that's in the second column, which is less important than the thing that we call vital. So the third point, the takeaway, just to signal where I'm going, is that it is not clear at all to me today how the current generation of American leadership, Democrats and Republicans, and the political culture, folks like us, will meet the demand for clarity in recognizing American national interests. I don't want to be part of the general Washington funk, uh, which I'm not, okay, myself, but I would say looking at discussions of this topic in general, which I did a little reading as I was trying to see where's, it, where's the conversation gone since I thought about this very hard back uh, about a decade ago. And I would say not very far, not very clear, not very helpful. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations had a commission on American national interests. And what was the main consensus of this commission effort? And it was that there was a dissensus. Okay. The members of this commission identified a hundred different vital American national interests. I would say anybody that's got a hundred vital interests has also none. Okay, none. If you have a hundred priorities, you have no priorities. Okay, no priorities. So a hundred don't do it. One of the vital interests that they identified was the territorial integrity of Canada. I presume there was some Canada-friendly member or, well, I don't know, maybe an ambassador to Canada or whatever. Okay, but in any case. So think about it yourself. I mean, President Obama says we have a vital national interest in Afghanistan, agree or disagree. U.S. has a vital national interest in the territorial integrity of Canada. You'll see from the list that the commission offers, and from my own view, I don't think so. Imagine Canada falls apart. I mean, I have no harsh feelings about Canada. I like Canada. I like ca Canadians, okay? But so Canada, Quebec secedes, or even the West secedes, and Canada. And, the, and Quebec secedes. I actually, uh, after we did our commission report, the Canadian government asked me to come and you know give a presentation. And I gave this discussion just in these terms. I said, and just just think about it, from an American point of view. This is not from a Canadian point of view. I think from a Canadian point of view, they have a vital national interest in Canada remaining territorially unified. But from an American point of view, if there was three Canadas, how bad is that? I said to them, you know, we would renegotiate NAFTA. Three are weaker than one. We would probably get a better deal the second time around. <laughs> Maybe even we would pick up another state or two. I mean, some of the western states, they got a lot of energy. You know, why not? Okay. Could fill in the space between here and Alaska. So from an American point of view, how bad is that? Okay. So we're talking about American national interest, not Canadian national interest. So I would not say... Canada's 
us. Uh, territorial integrity is a vital American interest. Just so I'm an equal opportunity offender here, let me give another example. Uh, you, many of you followed uh, probably, I'm sure, some, at least to some extent, the discussions in Copenhagen. So the, about climate uh, disruption and the attempt to get some version of a, a greenhouse gas uh, limitation in order to try to limit uh, emissions of, or the, the total emission of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to 450 parts per million by 2050. Well, the, uh, a group of nations called the Alliance of Small Island States, 43 of them, made a strong argument at Copenhagen that the target to have 450 parts per million, which would, according to the current scientific estimates, have a good chance of raising the temperature, mean temperature of the globe by two degrees centigrade over the period after that, was too high. And that it needed to be reduced to one and a half degrees centigrade, so that there's fewer parts per million, or otherwise some of these islands would be underwater. So here's Mr. Ian Fry, the Tuvalu lead climate negotiator, December 12, 2009. Quote, the entire population of Tuvalu lives below two meters above sea level. The highest point above sea level in the entire nation of Tuvalu is only four meters. And he explains that if, there's, if temperature goes up two degrees centigrade, uh, mean the sea will rise more than two meters, and so his island may be underwater. Okay. So, what? Why do I care? Okay. Why do you care? Why should America care? What American national interests are engaged if the sea rises two meters, and some islands disappear, some island nations disappear? I would say, as a human being, I certainly care about the people who live there. So we should get our lifeboat. Yep. Maybe they should move. But I don't think I have very strong interest in how many countries there are in the world. I have interest in the people that live in them. In principle, actually, Tuvalu, I'm sure, is a nice place. I have an interest in the Seychelles, which is another one of these, because I've always wanted to go fishing there. Okay, That's just myself as a person. But from a national point of view, why do we care? So trying to think clearly about American national interest will be extremely hard for Americans because some Americans care hugely about whatever the topic is, wherever their family came from, wherever they happen to be interested in, whatever issue they happen to be interested in. So one of the questions I want uh, to put to the group when we get to the conversation is any thoughts and suggestions about how the process in the U.S. might lead to some greater degree of clarity and agreement and consensus about what are interests that, we, that matter more and what are the ones that matter less. So that's once over lightly. That's my three big takeaways. How am I going to proceed? First, I'm going to take you through a little discussion of the principles for thinking about American national interests that we developed in the course of this commission. And I'll state them briefly. And you can read them on the web page of the Belfer Center at Harvard if you want to read the whole commission report. Secondly, I'm going to uh, take you through the summary statement of what are, in the view of the members of the commission, uh, vital national interest, extremely important interest, just important interest, and less important interest. So just what the lists are. And I think those are in the handout that was, that was sent. And then uh, thirdly, I'm going to drill down on one interest, uh, or one set of interests and one uh, specific threat to interests, namely uh, nuclear terrorism, a topic that I've been working on lately and I've been thinking a lot about. And I think one of the places where one may even see some uh, elements of a consensus. So if that's okay, that's the plan. So actually, let me see here. So here's this commission uh, on American national interests, the members. 
This is in 2000, uh, before, just before the, the, uh, the Bush administration. Uh, and I'm gonna give you 10, ten, ten quick points about principles for thinking about national interests that this group agreed on. First principle. First is the necessity for priorities in making a hierarchy of interests. As I said before in the takeaways, you can't have 100 priorities. So what's more important than something else that's important? And I think a not bad way to approach this is to make four columns. You can make your own columns. Vital, extremely important, just important and less important. Mm -hmm. Two, the commission insists, and I insist when I do this with my students, that the word vital in vital interest means what the dictionary says it used to mean. So go to Webster and ask, what does it say? And it says, quote, essential to the existence or continuance of something, indispensable, close quote. So vital means what the dictionary says it means. Mm -hmm. Government officials use vital interest to mean what? This is very important to me, promiscuously I would say. In fact, this, in part this is an occupational hazard. Imagine you're the Secretary of State or the Assistant Secretary or the person receiving uh, someone at the Pentagon and you say, welcome, Mr. Head of State. Your country is not really so important to us. So always the communique says the vital interest between the U.S. and Tuvalu led to this meeting and discussion and so forth. So the terms are used I would say promiscuously, but in our thinking about the issues, we should distinguish between the rhetoric and our analysis, and analytically, vital should be saved for what is essential for existence or continuance, what's indispensable. Mm -hmm. Point three, this commission, uh, after struggling with it, subscribed to the one-liner from the Cold War in fact, if you go back to even NSC 68, uh, mm -hmm. the proposition that said the core interest is, quote, to preserve the U.S. as a free nation with our fundamental institutions and values intact. Well, it's pretty hard to improve on that. Okay. Preserve the U.S. as a free nation with our fundamental institutions and values intact. The commission tried to update it just a little bit, and so what we said was survival as a free nation with our fundamental institutions and values. And international conditions required, therefore, in the current vernacular, to safeguard and enhance the well-being of Americans in a free and secure nation. So think survival, okay, for the country with its values and its institutions. And when you try to think about, then, hierarchy and what matters more and what matters less, Imagine the country disappears. Well, then all the things that you thought mattered relative to that obviously mattered less. So it's a good way to think about hierarchy. Fourth point, there's an analytic connection between national interest on the one hand and current opportunities to advance our interests or alternatively, current threats to those interests. So there's an analytic link between the two, but the two are analytically distinct issues. Interests exist independent of threats to the interests or opportunities to advance the interests. Now, f obviously and understandably in debate, most of this uh, gets confused because people are just talking about the interests that happen to be engaged by current threats or by current opportunities. But you'll see when we get to the Commission's list of American vital interests, we say 
the U.S. has a vital interest in not having hostile hegemones on our borders. There's not much prospect of Canada or Mexico soon becoming a hostile hegemon. So one would normally think of that as what needs to be preserved or a condition that's essential for the well-being and security of the U.S. But the, the distinction here is between what the interest is and what might constitute a threat or a opportunity. Uh, next point. Interests are not just what the current government says they are. So the answer to the question about agree or disagree with President Obama's statement that the U.S. has a vital interest in Afghanistan, the answer that says, well, of course we do because the president said so, answer not correct, not correct. We may have a vital interest or not, that's to, for us to debate here, but the fact that the current government happens to think that there's a vital interest does not make it so. So history is replete with examples of countries that fail to recognize a vital national interest to their peril, sometimes destruction, or that imagined that it had a vital national interest, which it pursued uh, mistakenly. Hmm? Next point, beyond a basic core of uh, what, what, what some of you, if you're a political theorist, will call realist or even hyper-realist uh, interests, which is where this centrist group uh, mainly comes from, there are further layers of interests or interpretations of interests that are constructed in ways that reflect some more subjective choice and creativity. So, for example, is NATO a vital interest of the U.S.? Well, you could have a discussion of that back and forth one way or the other. In, in one sense, not strictly. In another sense, and the Commission finally concluded that NATO certainly addresses a vital interest of the U.S., that we establish strong relations with Europe to prevent the emergence of hostile hegemon, especially in an area of geostrategic importance to the U.S. But you could have a discussion of that. This problem, though, or this issue could take us off far afield, but I'm just stating the point here uh, succinctly, and we may want to come back to it. Next point, interests are analytically distinct from what a nation is prepared to do to protect those interests. So let me do this one carefully, because this, again, is also easily confused. One could have an interest, and in principle, if you have a vital interest, that means that's essential for your survival. You should be prepared to fight for it. But having the interests on the one hand and what you are prepared to do to protect the interest are separate questions. So generally, there's a there's a spectrum of corollary injunctions that says for vital interest you should be prepared to fight, for extremely important interest you should be prepared to commit forces to meet the threats or lead a coalition of forces. So you go down the spectrum, but those are two separate questions. Uh, next point, judgments about the hierarchy of American national interests are often embodied formally in international commitments. One of the ways to, to signal that there's a vital interest is for a country to enter into a treaty obligation, like NATO treaty with Article 5, that says an attack on one will be regarded as an attack on all, which then suggests your territory is almost like my territory, which then suggests I've concluded I have a vital interest in your survival of the same sort that I have in my survival and well-being. So treaties uh, that, are for, that formally commit the U.S. to uh, take a position or to take an action are often a way of signaling a judgment about interests. And the debate about whether or not 
Israel, for example, should have an Article 5 equivalent uh, treaty uh, commitment from the U.S. is a way of trying to address that question. Um, last point. Uh, the relationship between interests and values is subtle, complex, and profound. My old professor, when I was first a graduate student, Henry Kissinger, wrote a book called Diplomacy, in which for 900 pages, he wrestles with this dichotomy between interests and values, and he don't, doesn't like for me to say so, but I've offered him my view without resolution. Okay. Uh, the, he, he tells the story of the competition in 20th century American foreign policy between the idealism represented by Woodrow Wilson and the realism of Teddy Roosevelt. But when the commission finally said, how would we deal with this issue of interests and values, we said, we, we liked a, an earlier concept in which interests and values seem less dichotomous and more alternative, alternative expressions of valuation. So the survival and well-being of the U.S. is not just an interest in contrast to American values, but is a core value essential to Americans as well. Now, some of my students say, well, that's just a weasel way for getting around the fact that you didn't give a good answer to the question either, I would say I'd go back to my first point. It's subtle and complex. <laughs> okay. So this is once over lightly uh, main principles for thinking about American national interest, at least as reflected in the work of this commission. And as I say, you can read about them if you're interested in a little more on each of them. On the commission, in the Commission's Hold Report, which is available on the website of the Belfer Center at Harvard. So let me take us to the next. So now I'm moving to part two, which is the summary of national interests uh, reflected in the conclusions reached by the members of this commission. And these charts are in your in your handout. So what did we do as a commission to try to think about this? We said this commission and the members were not, they did not come down from the mountain with these things written on a tablet, okay? Uh, the status of these judgments is only that they reflect the best judgment of this group of people in terms of their own, their consensus that they could agree on. But we said that we nonetheless thought we could do people a service by being as unambiguous as we could about what our conclusions were. So these may be wrong, but at least they should be clear. So we summarized interest under four labels, as I said, vital, extremely important, just important and less important. So vital national interests are conditions strictly necessary, strictly necessary, that's the big word there, to safeguard and enhance America's survival and well-being in a free and secure nation. So then imagine you're making your list of what's vital to that. Well, here's our list of five, only five. Prevent, deter, reduce threat of nuclear, biological weapons attacks on the U.S. Ensure allies survival. So that didn't mean ensure that allies are not attacked. Ensure their survival. And active cooperation. Prevent the emergence of hostile major powers or failed states on U.S. borders. A failed state is closer than a major power in the current conditions, but either one would be you know, change our, change our world. Ensure viability and stability of major global systems, uh, particularly after seeing the meltdown of the financial system. That's a good reminder. And establish productive relations consistent with U.S. interests with nations that could become strategic adversaries, China being the, 
the lead candidate, but also Russia. This is now back in 2000, yep, when we did this. Extremely important. So extremely important means extremely important, just not quite vital. Okay? And there's arguments about what should go on which list. And as I say, you may have a different view, and we may want to discuss that. So extremely important interests are conditions that, if compromised, would severely prejudice. So it's quite bad, severely prejudice, but not strictly imperil the ability of the U.S. to safeguard and enhance the well-being of Americans in a free and secure nation. So, prevent, deter, and reduce the threat of a nuclear or biological weapon anywhere. Well, this is a good one to reflect on. And the more I've thought of it, I'm not quite sure about that. So, if one nuclear bomb goes off in Mumbai or London, as President Obama uh, said in, when he was at the UN, th this will change our world and our way of life. So this one, you might have an argument about. Maybe it deserves to get pushed up to the other list. Uh, I'm not sure. The commission in 2000 judged it to be here. Prevent regional proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Acceptance of, excuse the, uh, this was uh, a typo, international rules of law and mechanisms for resolving conflict. Emergence of regional hegemones in other important regions. well-being of allies and friends, democracy and prosperity and stability in the Western Hemisphere, major conflicts uh, in regions, a lead in key military and other strategic technologies, especially IT, massive controlled immigration into the U.S., suppressed terrorism, and then prevent genocide. So again, when the commission report came out, my goodness, I had the, how many press discussions and debates about, you guys really are hopeless. Uh, how can you have prevent genocide is not a vital American national interest? Yeah. To which the answer is, genocide is about as horrible a thing imaginable. After the Holocaust, Americans said, and the world said, never again. There was a genocide in Rwanda. Did the U.S. survive as a free nation with our fundamental institutions and values? I think we did. Should our consciences be stricken? Yes, they should. Is that a horrible thing? If we could do something to stop it, should we do? I, I would vote that we do. Okay. But is it a vital American national interest that there's not a genocide in Sudan? Okay. I don't think so. Is it extremely important? I think yes. Okay. okay, important. Important are conditions, and some lists that we call this just important, okay? But important are conditions, if compromised, would have major negative consequences. So these things really matter. They matter a lot. They just don't matter as much as the things that got onto the second list and the first list. So massive human rights violations. If the U.S. were to leave Afghanistan, and if a Taliban or quasi-Taliban group should take over provinces or even substantial parts of, of uh, Afghanistan, will there be massive human rights violation? Children won't be able to go to school. Women won't be able to go to work. Women will have to uh, go back to, uh, at least in those regions, Taliban uh, uh, practices. Uh, people may be stoned. Uh, uh, so massive human rights violations, is that a vital American national interest? Again, I don't think so. Promote pluralism, freedom, and democracy in strategically important states. This was part of the Bush uh, freedom agenda. Uh, President Bush thought this was vital. Uh, in the view of this commission, it was important. Not even extremely important. Prevent, if possible, in conflicts in strategically less significant geographic areas. So you guys are heartless about the fact that there's a war going on in Sri Lanka or in the Congo. What, four million people may have been killed in the conflict in the Congo that's been going on now for uh, 10 or 15 years? Should that 
be of concern to Americans? Absolutely. Is it an interest for Americans? It should be. We have a big country, you have interest in everything. But is it a vital interest in this group? No. Okay. Uh, for this one, we had a great debate too. Protect the lives and well-being of American citizens who are targeted or taken hostile by terrorists elsewhere. When an American is captured somewhere, we become extremely excited as a country, and I can understand the politics of that. Actually, in the debate with uh, trying to get the six parties to uh, squeeze North Korea, the Japanese are absolutely focused on the 12 abductees who were just kidnapped off the beaches in, uh, in Japan. Is that horrible? It's absolutely horrible. Is it a vital American interest? I don't think so. Uh, reduce the economic gap between the rich and the poor. You can look at the rest of the list. Prevent nationalization, boost domestic output. Less important or secondary. They're not unimportant, okay? So if you only make the last list, this is not too bad, okay? It's not too bad. They're important, they're desirable. Actually, as human beings, we should have a great deal of interest in this, but whether there's a bilateral trade defi deficit, no. Enlarging democracy for its own sake. Democracy is a great form of government, okay, but everywhere, not vital. Territorial integrity or the political constitution of states elsewhere, Canada, no. Uh, Exports for particular sectors, they may be very important for your business, but I don't think so. Okay, so um, part two, uh, divide uh, your, in trying to think about the hierarchy, I would recommend a not bad way to think about it is make four columns. There's no magic to vital, extremely important, important, and less important, but you know, pick your, it sh you shouldn't have 20 columns because that's too much. And if you wanted to just have three, that's fine. And think about what's the definition of vital and something less than vital but still extremely important and something less than that that's still important. And then try to think of, go back to the criteria we discussed earlier and say, how would you make the list? Mm -hmm. So that's part two. Now I'm going to move to part three briefly. Uh, so, part three. Uh, not too many things President Obama and President Bush agree on, but uh, one is the single most important national security threat we face. Nuclear weapons in the hands of terrorists. So think about 9-11. Think about a nuclear 9-11. President Obama says that'll change our world. The uh, Commission on Strategic Posture of the U.S., this was Schlesinger Perry, uh, talks about the tipping point in proliferation, particularly with Iran and North Korea proceeding. They had uh, mirrored the high-level panel for the U.N. that Brent Scowcroft was uh, the American representative on, uh, which talked about the erosion of the non-proliferation regime to the point that it could become irreversible and result in a cascade of proliferation. So uh, what if, I think I gave you a target chart for DC, this is New York, in the Nuclear Terrorism book, uh, which is a book I wrote in, it was published in 2004. Uh, I tell the story of Dragonfire, a source that was reporting a month after 9-11 that Al-Qaeda had got a small nuclear bomb out of the former Soviet arsenal, now had it in New York, was about to explode it. US government proceeded for a week thinking that might actually be the case. It's when Cheney left Washington thinking it might be in D.C. Nest teams went to New York to look for signs. It turned out to be a false alarm. But the main point was there was no reason for dismissing this as a real possibility. And uh, th there was no basis in science or logic or politics for thinking that it could not have been happening. It was about a 10 KT bomb that would have fitted, fit in the back of an SUV. This imagines it was in Times Square. Everything in the red zone disappears, and the blue zone looks like the federal office building in Oklahoma City after a homegrown American terrorist bombed it back in 96, in, uh, uh, I think. Uh, so what about in D.C.? 
Well, again, you can see this is just a small 10 kT, 10 kT blast. It's a little bit smaller than Hiroshima, uh, like the bomb that Dragonfire had described. That was a, its estimated uh, yield. Uh, and you can imagine here if it was at the Capitol, and I, this is Obama's uh, statement in September of 2009, just one nuclear weapon in a city, whether New York or London or Beijing, could kill hundreds of thousands of people, would badly destabilize our security, our economy, would change our very ways of life. As I say, this is back to the question of whether a bomb somewhere else would make us live so differently that maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, book, I uh, do the following argument. I'm just taking you through the, the crux of it. Uh, part one in the book says, inevitable that if we just keep doing what we're doing, this is gonna happen. And part two says, preventable. It's the most important thing, that there's a feasible, affordable agenda of actions that if we took them, would reduce the likelihood to nearly zero. If everybody just keeps doing what they're doing, I myself estimated and believe that within a decade, so that would be by the end of 2014, the greater than even chance that this happens in a major city somewhere. This Commission on Preventing WMD Proliferation and Terrorism issued its report. This was a bipartisan commission established by Congress as a successor to the 9-11 Commission. The chairs were Senator Bob Graham and Jim Talent. Uh, I had the honor to serve on it. It reported uh, last year its view that there was a greater than even chance that somewhere in the world a nuclear or a biological terrorist attack would occur in the next five years. Uh, Warren Buffett, who's the richest uh, investor in the world and a great odds maker, since he's in the insurance and reinsurance business, says he thinks it's inevitable and doesn't see how it can't happen, won't happen. He then offers this very nice uh, mathematical identity which says if the chance of a weapon of mass destruction in a given year is 10% and you roll that same probability out for 50 years, the chance becomes 99.5 that it happens. So that's just a mathematical identity. That's if, if it's 10% a year. He doesn't say what the number is, but that's just the judgment. So if you look at the people that have borne responsibility for trying to deal with this problem, from Tenet uh, to Bob Gates to Hillary Clinton or Jim Jones or John Brennan, there's a unanimous view that this is the most significant threat to American national interest today. So you could go through the analysis. I'm not going to do it tonight because it's another topic, but we can come back to the discussion. How do you get to the proposition that this is a real possibility, even maybe inevitable? Think who, what, where, when, how. Part two is the good news, a preventable catastrophe by a feasible, affordable agenda of actions, some of which we're not taking, some not fast enough. And the Buffett estimate, again, just to make it plain, if the chance had been 1% a year and we reduced it to one, sorry, had been 10% and we took actions that reduced it to 1% a year, the likelihood of living the next 50 years without such an explosion is 60.5%. So how to prevent, in this uh, book I offer my uh, summary of a strategy for prevention under a doctrine of three no's, no loose nukes, no new nascent nukes and no new nuclear weapon states. So no loose nukes means everything locked up to a gold standard. You say, how much gold does U.S. lose from Fort Knox? Not one ounce. I gave this briefing in the Kremlin in uh, 2005 after publishing the book. And uh, I said, you know, with all the chaos, all the confusion, all the, all the corruption that accompanied the collapse of the Soviet Union, how many of the treasures that they keep in their Kremlin armory, their icons and stuff who have gone missing? The answer is zero. So human beings know how to lock up things we don't want people to steal. It's just hard work. Uh, secondly, no new nascent nukes means no new national capacities to enrich uranium or reprocess plutonium. That's a red line that Iran is going across right now. It's gone across and is proceeding apace. And no new nuclear weapon states says stop at where we were with eight and a half, that is North Korea, self-declared but unrecognized, stop the bleeding before rolling back. <clears throat> so I've got more details on what would be required for each of those and 
I'll put these slides up for, for the purposes. Just to remind you, or many of you I think are familiar with this because of your own work, President Obama has been seized of this issue. Uh, on, he's been obviously uh, entangled in lots of other issues too, and in, in particular, the, the near or the likelihood of a Great Depression, which focused his mind and took most of his attention for much of the first year. But in any case, at his Prague speech in April 2009, and in what's going to be now the first ever nuclear security summit in Washington, which is in April uh, of this year, uh, where he's got 42 heads of state coming to talk about it, he outlined some principles for the U.S. attempting to address this issue of trend lines that are otherwise driving us to disaster. So reducing the rule, role of nukes in the U.S. national security strategy, the posture review will be out shortly, and you'll see some signs of that. Securing all weapons and materials to a gold standard in four years, that's back to the core that I was talking about with the three no's. Negotiating new agreements, and I think very shortly one should hear that the start follow on has been concluded, and uh, Vice President Biden gave a speech, I think, today, uh, uh, pushing, for, uh, beginning to push for CTBT, and a stronger IAEA. Uh, so that's once over uh, lightly on nuclear terrorism. And uh, so here's an advertisement for the book. If you go to Amazon, you can get the paperback now for even uh, cheaper. And when Warren Buffett did his uh, capitalist jamboree in uh, Omaha in 2005, he chooses one book every year, which he makes the book of the year. And he said, he called up and he said, I'm going to make your book the book of the year. I said, hey, you know, I think I've gone to heaven. And he said, just watch the Amazon charts. Uh, so uh, the day after he announced this is at, at his jamboree, all of a sudden you get a big spike in your Amazon sales. Uh, so he's very market oriented. Uh, so uh, let me see here. I think that's part three. And if I can take us back here quickly uh, to conclude, I said we would start with the, uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, with a concrete example. And I'd say we can each think about that for ourselves agree, disagree, and why. Okay. And I'd say my own view is disagree. I do not think the U.S. has vital interests in Afghanistan. And when we get to the Q&As, I'll tell you why, if anybody's interested. Thank you very much. I'm Sharon Jackson. I work for Battelle Memorial Institute. And given what you've laid out there, it seems to be, uh, it seems to me that what you've defined are basically permanent interests. Would you agree with that or not? Uh, very good question and the answer. Basically, yes. That is, the, the interests uh, are defined by the concept of interest and the, uh, uh, the core proposition that what we mean by vital American national interests are uh, conditions necessary for survival and well-being of the country with its values and institutions. But the conditions that are necessary for survival uh, become more, become clearer or more vivid depending on developments in the world. So let me give a, a for example. And we had a good discussion of this in the commission. This is now back in, in 2000. So people said, well, what about climate disruption? Hmm? And so some people said, wait a minute, that's another subject. You know, they have, let the climate or environmental people do that. That's just, you know, less important. And then the question was, well, now well, let's think, what do you mean by climate disruption? So if you look at the global systems and you look at the discussion in the commission report, it's got financial you know, and others, and it's got environment, or it's got the, you know. So if, imagine, just for the moment, that 
the effect of some climate change was to uh, so change the atmosphere for the U.S. that we couldn't breathe and live in the U.S. Well, obviously then, the U.S. wouldn't survive with our institutions and values intact. So the, the interests are permanent, the vital interests are permanent, but the conditions that might impact it may change depending on what's happening in the world and make, may, may make more vivid to you, to us. I mean, not, b before one imagined that human behavior plus other activities could change the atmosphere in a way that made a huge difference to the ability to live in the U.S., who would ever have thought of that, okay? I mean, you wouldn't do. But once one identifies it, one could say, now if you said, well, is it a vital national interest for the U.S. that the mean temperature not go up by two degrees centigrade? I would say, I don't think so, but let's just see. What does it do? Okay, so things get a little warmer in Boston. You know, doesn't seem so bad to me, okay? Uh, they get a little hotter in Florida. Well, I'd say that's okay. We have air conditioning. Well, the water rises a little bit. So people that have uh, adjacency to the water, you know, their properties become a little less valuable. So it takes some time to adjust. I'd say we're likely to survive as a, as a country under those conditions. Whereas if you said, well, things change so much that half of the U.S. is underwater, I'd say, well, that's, you know, maybe a different story. I'm Duncan Brown, Johns Hopkins APL. Um, quick question on the nuclear side. Your thoughts on the idea of uh, taking the nuclear arsenal to zero and the rhetoric surrounding that and whether that really gets us anywhere? Oh, that's a huge uh, topic in itself, and I'll just uh, do the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the fact that the, con or that the, the, uh, the concept of uh, a world free of nuclear weapons or eliminating all nuclear weapons as part of the agenda is pretty hard to believe for me as an old Cold Warrior. Uh, I actually wrote a book with a couple of co-authors, uh, Joe Nye and Al Carnesale, back in the mid-'80s uh, called Fateful Visions, in which we considered the zero or near, near zero as one of the options, and it seemed infeasible and if it were feasible, it also seemed unstable. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, I think the fact that four of the wisest uh, and bluest chip Cold War uh, statesmen uh, have endorsed this view uh, means that everybody should think again about it. Okay? So for, for a rethinking exercise, I would say this is a, this is a good one. When, uh, so I told my students originally about it, I said, you know, if I had to choose between the consensus view of Kissinger, Schultz, Nunn, and Perry, and the view of Allison, I'd say that's a pretty easy choice. Uh, I, I don't understand why, but I agree with them. Okay. Uh, uh, so I currently uh, subscribe to the current, to, to, the, to the following view, and I think Sam Nunn has given the best account, account of it. Uh, for the U.S., would we be better off if there were no nuclear weapons in the world? The answer is that's an easy yes, okay, very easy. Why is that? Because we're so strong in every other dimension. And my Russian friend, Andrei Kokoshin, always says, I see why you're in favor of this now when you weren't before. He says, you want to make the world safe for a non-nuclear rogue superpower. Okay, that's your idea. I, well, that wasn't really my idea, but I can see how it might look that way if you were a Russian. Okay? So, uh, but from an American point of view, I'd say that, that we would be better off if, there, if nuclear weapons had never been invented. Now, they are not going to be disinvented. They are what they are. So the argument, and the best argument that's made by the four horsemen and that I subscribe to, in my view, is uh, Sam Nunn's metaphor that the elimination of all nuclear weapons is something like the top of a mountain in which most of us can't see the top of the mountain from where we are now. And I certainly can't. 
but that if we have a good idea which direction sh we should be going in. So if we start climbing the mountain, we'll get to a base camp. And once we get to the next base camp, we'll be above some clouds and we'll be able to see further. And then we can worry about going further. So in terms of the arsenals that the US and Russia has now, still, I think there's probably 30,000 nuclear weapons in some form, you know, with the two arsenals. That's clearly way, way, way down the mountain. So we have a huge way to go getting to some number less than that. And the reason for doing so, the main reason for doing so, is if this in some way allows us to deal with the urgent issues, and that's the, the big question mark, with the urgent issues, because I, in my debate and discussion with the Four Horsemen, say I'm, I'm more of a short or, or a shorter term thinker, and I worry about the avalanche more than I worry about the top of the mountain. I think if North Korea becomes a recognized nuclear weapon state, which it almost has done, uh, and if Iran breaks through and uh, uh, comes to have a nuclear arsenal, I don't see why this is, the whole regime is not going to unravel. And I think if it unravels, it's a little bit like an avalanche coming down on you when you're trying to climb the mountain. It's, uh, so it's the immediate problems that exercise me more. And with respect to the immediate problems, the argument from the Four Horsemen is that if the US and Russia are showing leadership towards a world in which eventually there would be no <coughs> nuclear weapons, this is not going to change the view of Kim Jong-il or of Ahmadinejad, but it may change the view of some other states like Turkey or South Africa or uh, who will then agree on tighter, uh, on a tighter and, and a more enforceable regime that will have some impact on these troublesome states. It's a complicated argument, but that's the, I think that's the nub of it. I apologize. It's, it's such a big topic that I, that's too long an answer. Thank you. I request a short uh, answer on two of my questions. I'm, I'm Dr. Ravi Sharma, independent consultant, nuclear physicist. Um, the first question is that Afghanistan is important to us from two points of views. One is that they harbor people who did 9-11. Uh, second is if they start taking hold of um, their own country, Taliban, uh, take, uh, take hold of that, and then it permeates and, and broadens into Pakistan and maybe causes problems for other neighbors like India, uh, do you see these two uh, facts emerging from one geographic location as playing an uh, important role in how we um, manage this threat? Second point, uh, second question is that while we know how to contain damage from nuclear radiation as demonstrated by survival of Japan after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we do not yet know how to prevent environmental damage caused by biological agents. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Again, two uh, huge questions, and let me, I won't do justice to them, but I'll at least offer my short view. So with respect to Afghanistan, um, the, uh, I think the U.S. has a extremely important, and I'd say maybe close to vital, uh, I wouldn't even argue if we said vital, interest in eliminating uh, to the extent that we can global terrorists who want, who did 9-11 and who want to do 9-11 plus. So that's Al-Qaeda and its global terrorist uh, um, surround. Uh, now, most of these folks, uh, if uh, CIA or U.S. intelligence communities to be believed, and I would think that it is, are not in Afghanistan. I mean, uh, Denny, Denny Blair said the other day, he thinks there's fewer than 100 uh, al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. They're in Pakistan, in ungoverned Pakistan. So I would say they're the problem, not the, not the territory. And in any case, wherever they are, that's where we should go get them. Okay? So that's, uh, and, and I don't think that there's anything special about Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, it didn't grow them better than North Wajiristan or than 
than uh, Somalia. Uh, so wherever they are, I believe we should be about their uh, elimination. Uh, but I don't think that that requires, uh, I don't think that means Afghanistan is vital to the U.S. And I don't think that it actually requires the U.S. to be in Afghanistan in the manner that we are. That's my view. Uh, uh, so secondly, on the biological piece, again, a huge issue. I, I, I agree with you if I hear the implication of your, of your uh, question. Uh, I think the, the biological revolution that's represented in the uh, biotech world and uh, uh, genetic modification uh, will likely be as a driver to the 21st century, the first half of the 21st century, what nuclear was in the, in the second half of the, US, uh, of the 20th century. So nuclear, we pretty much have the picture. Now, I, uh, I think if, if one nuclear bomb explodes in Washington or New York, I believe that's going to change our world in such fundamental fashions. I don't have any doubt that I put that in my vital list. Okay. But I think in the biological space, as you say, uh, if somebody successfully crosses smallpox and, and Ebola, which is a doable thing in a lab, and which the Soviets worked on quite seriously, so you got something very contagious and very lethal. Uh, I agree with you. Where does it stop? And what then are the, you know, the ultimate uh, consequences of it? So I'd say bio is a big and worrisome task. And in this commission uh, that I mentioned before on preventing WMD terrorism and proliferation, Senators Graham and Talent were much more focused on the bio piece of it than on the than on the nuclear. Good evening, uh, Forrest Hare from George Mason School of Public Policy. First of all, thank you. Very uh, enlightening presentation. The, uh, the process of securitization, securitization is a lot about linking threats to your, your referent object, in this case, America's survival and well-being, where those ex existential threats. And as you're well aware, a number of the national and the vital national interests um, are actually, the threat is specifically identified, you know, reducing the threat of nuclear weapons and uh, the threat of hostile major powers, but in some of them you're actually talked about the referent object. What is that you want to protect? So for example in the number four, ensuring the viability and stability of major global systems. Well the issue then becomes, I would say, is there's so many different ways to threaten that and so now you can very quickly get back to this 400 you know, different priorities. So, so did you look at all about, okay, so how can I now classify these threats as what are realistic threats to those things that I should focus on and maybe what are not in order to try to reduce, you know, keep the, prolifer the agenda of proliferation, if you will, because if you go in the long term, you know, anything could be a threat to the environment, you know, and raise that four or five degrees. So how do you, again, limit the agenda to something manageable? Again, thank you. Extremely good question, and I wish I had a, such a, uh, as good an answer. I think that the the impulse I applaud, which is to uh, avoid the uh, uh, the expansion of the lists of things to be addressed until it gets so large that it's unmanageable. And I agree that. In some sense, everything connects to everything else. But there was a famous political scientist at Yale, Carl Deutsch, who used to say, everything connects to everything else, but not as much as uh, everything else. So things are connected, but some things connect more with more impact than others. So when we try to ask a question about, let's say, climate change, uh, which is a tough one to think about. Uh, and so someone says, okay, here on the basis of the best estimates, uh, 450 parts per million has a reasonable chance of raising the mean temperature by 2 degrees centigrade in, so if it's 450 in 2050 by 2100. So I have to think, okay, so how big a deal is that? Now, for Tuvalu, it's a bigger deal than for the U.S. 
Uh, and how long is 100 years? And what are the other ways for me to address it? So I, I mean, I think that there, uh, it is unfortunately the case that there's climate and there's bio and there's nuclear and there's you know, lots of other things and they need to be addressed. But I think the fact that, the, that there's linkage between them doesn't mean that the linkage is tight and, the, and it doesn't mean that it's quick. So I, I would say I try to parse it down that way, but I don't think it's possible to exclude if somebody wants to put on the table that, I mean, and I think this is where more frequently we get tangled up. Somebody says, well, let me put on the table that what's happening in Afghanistan, uh, whether they have a unified country or not, or whether they have a, uh, whether they're growing poppies or not, okay? or whether they have uh, good schools or not, is so important to the U.S. And so then they work their way through this. And I look and I say, I'm extremely happy that they have better schools. And I would even give some money from my pocket as a, as a, you know, if I, as, as a charity, so as a person. But I don't think as a nation that there's uh, 200 countries. I don't see anything why that one is all that much more deserving than what's going on in Somalia or in Sudan or in Haiti. Uh, he's got the microphone. Sir, uh, thanks. Uh, Major Jeremy Codkin from U.S. Special Operations Command down Tampa. Um, I'd like to ask about your point about decoupling the interest from what you would do to protect it. Uh, to me, it would seem that national interest and vital national interest specifically, uh, you would have to know what you would do to procure or um, protect or secure them uh, by decoupling them, like I mentioned. It would seem that you water down the debate by not knowing then how to respond via either whether it's using your military to nation build or to respond to a, a uh, existential threat uh, by not intrinsically seeing the relation between the interest and what you do to defend it. It's a good, it's an extremely good question, and I ran over that point uh, pretty quickly because, uh, and I would say you, you'd, you'd find a little bit more uh, clarity about it in the report if you have a chance to look at it. The, the, I think the reason why I, I made the point and why we discuss it is that uh, I may have a vital interest in the stability of the global financial system because if it collapses and then we have a Great Depression, uh, I can then say what that's going to do to the U.S. and its well-being, and I can also say what is this going to do to international politics. But that doesn't mean that I should be sending my army to fight you know, for the global financial system. And maybe a different instrument is the appropriate way to address it. I should recognize that it's vital because Excuse me, if there's a Great Depression, think what other things happen, and pretty soon one thinks, yikes, I didn't realize how damaging that was going to be to the core of the U.S. survival and its well-being you know, of its citizens. So, I, and I, as I said, I think as a, as, a, as a rule of thumb, as a corollary, as a first approximation, if something's vital, that means you better do whatever you can to preserve it or to, to, to sustain it. And in some instance, that's being prepared to fight somebody. In some instance, it's trying to shape something so you don't have to fight them. In some instances, it's because you're, or it's, a, it's using some other instrument. And if one has a lesser interest, then again, in principle, as a first approximation, one should be willing if, it, if a military instrument is the appropriate instrument, to use it in some lesser fashion. Like, for example, so, I mean, I, I would say in the case of Taiwan is a good example. So maybe in the abstract, so if we started over and we didn't have any treaties, the question of what interest would the U.S. have and whether Taiwan survived as a separate entity from China. 
Well, there's 25 million people live there. They have a democracy. They have a successful economy. They're more successful than, you know, two-thirds of the countries in the world. So, and they're nice people and whatever, so why shouldn't they live their lives the way they want to? Okay. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, China is a huge country. We have a lot of interest with China. China thinks this is a, you know, is a uh, is an errant province. That's uh, 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 so. Um, when it came time, uh, Kissinger decided to sell them out. In effect, or Nixon did. Uh, as between China and Taiwan, was that a good decision? I think it, I, you know, I think it was. In terms of our treaty obligation, it says. We're prepared to support them, but not to fight for them. So we'll, you know, send them uh, uh, the material which with, the, with which they can fight. And I would say that reflects the level of interest about, you know, about appropriately. Is it on? Hi, I'm uh, Samira Daniels. Um, I've, I've been following the six-party talks and, you know, just reading as much as I can about uh, negotiations over nuclear issues and so forth. And I was, I was struck by the fact that um, it seems that the, the diplomacy and the conflict resolution um, tools are so inadequate. And, and I think in part it has to do, and this is my, you know, hypothesis, that it has to do with just a complete lack of understanding of cultures, too, uh, exacerbated then by the fact, uh, as that gentleman was talking, uh, mentioned about India and Pakistan, uh, getting through to you know various parties in a way which which uh, which are, which is productive. I see real gaps in those areas from the American side, and as I said in. in reviewing all of the conversations about nuclear and weapons. So if you could elaborate on that. And this is particularly the North Korean six-party talks or in the, yeah, oh, good. Uh, again, this is a fantastic group of, I mean, each one of these topics, you know, is a topic for a long conversation, okay. So uh, again, just the tip of the iceberg, I mean. Uh, does the U.S. have a very good understanding of other countries cultures, priorities, interests in general when we engage them. And I would say... Right, to the issue at hand. The answer is, I'd say our record is pretty lousy, pretty lousy. So if we were a business, we wouldn't be uh, in good shape, okay? Because you would be out there trying to sell something to somebody and lo and behold, they're not buying it. So in the North Korean case, uh, the story is really appalling, appalling, okay. So, uh, and this will seem unduly partisan, and I'm not unduly partisan in general, but I would say our handling of North Korea in the past eight years was terrible, okay. And why is that? We said, Okay, when we announced the, or President Bush announced the axis of evil, that there was three bad amigos, uh, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea, and that the solution for them was to change the regimes. And then we went and knocked off one of them, okay? Okay, so uh, now we come to Kim Jong-il and we say, we have two demands. One, give up your nuclear weapons, and two, commit suicide. That's it, okay? And he says, well, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. I've got another idea. How about I keep my nuclear weapons, and how about you pay me for talking to you? And we said, well, no, we wouldn't do that. That would be, first, it's against what we want, and second, it would be extortion. Okay? Uh, that, now, the third round. We pay him, okay? Or the Koreans pay him, or the Japanese pay him to come to meetings to discuss. Okay? And the Chinese are sitting there looking, and they're thinking, what, what's going on here? Your priority is to collapse the regime. You said that was your priority. That's what you've been trying to do. That's what you want to do. What is our greatest nightmare? 
the collapse of the regime. Because we think if the regime collapses, first we say that there'll be a lot of, of uh, refugees. I've talked to the Chinese about this repeatedly. I say they don't care about refugees. They don't know what a million people come into China. They don't know within 10 million people how many people they have now. So this is not a big issue for them, I think. And they don't care that much about, well, these are miserable people. They've got a lot of miserable people in China. So uh, what do they care about? They care that South Korea would absorb North Korea, and it would. And then the American, uh, South Korea, is, who, who is their military ally? Us. So their military ally would be up on their border. Well, the Chinese narrative, that's why they fought the Korean War and pushed us back to the 38th parallel. They did. Okay? So we're trying to get the Chinese, who have the most leverage, to help us do what we want to do, which is exactly what they don't want to do. Well, how successful was that? Not very successful. And I think the Chinese have looked at this and thinking, are you guys serious, or do you don't understand the difference, or we don't want to go through the motions, and we've been prepared more, more frequently, and I'd say this is the way we got to where we are now, uh, to say, okay, well, we'll get together and we'll have another six-party talk about it. And the, Chinese, uh, the North Koreans have discovered that if they wait long enough, and if they're, uh, if they're, if they're uh, uncooperative enough, somebody will pay them to get them to come back to the meeting. And I would bet this happens again. So I would say good for Kim Jong-il and bad for us. Uh, Clay on uh, Air Force A-9 uh, Nuclear Analysis Division. My, uh, my question is non-nuclear, however, uh, and I want to go back to the, uh, uh, the statement from President Obama. Um, and my question involves the, the form of that statement uh, as much as it does the, the, the statement itself. It, it, it seems to smuggle in an assumption that there is something vital about Afghanistan without actually stating what it is, and then smuggles in an assumption that sending 18,000 troops there is going to solve it without stating how that's going to happen. 30, Would you? 30. I thought it was 30,000. Yeah. Uh, whatever. Uh, whatever. At any rate, um, w would you comment on the uh, on the on the form of that? Yeah. Uh, Extreme. Oh, my goodness. You told me this was a good group, and uh, so I would say good reading, very, very thoughtful. The, uh, and my colleague at Harvard, Rory Stewart, uh, who runs the Carr Center, uh, reminded me, I didn't know this, but if you go back and watch the tape of when he gives the speech, he almost swallows that line. So it's clear it, it's not his most comfortable line you know, in the, in the speech. Uh, so this, it says that we have a vital national interest in sending these 30,000 troops there without quite saying what is the interest on behalf of which we're sending the troops there, just precisely what, what you said. So uh, my understanding of, and, and then, then we get all of these fantastic reconstructions of the decision seminars you know, that uh, the Post and the Times have treated us to like a goldfish bowl of uh, deliberations. But in the debate about what, whether, well, I don't, I think, I see no evidence there was a good debate about, and, and a clear debate about whether the U.S. had a serious, a real vital interest in Afghanistan. But many people asserted that we did in the debate. And then the question is, well, what vital interest? And the candidates would have been two. One, no sanctuaries for global terrorists like Al-Qaeda, Perrin, and there aren't any now, okay? They happen to be over in Pakistan, but we're not proposing to send troops to Pakistan, okay? So it's a little puzzling, okay? So, and then secondly, then, well, there must be a vital interest in things in Afghanistan not unraveling Pakistan, because Pakistan, we can identify vital interests. And loose nukes, uh, uh, the takeover of the Pakistani government by some Islamic extremist, uh, uh, you know, uh, Pak uh, Taliban types uh, who would then come with complete with an arsenal, blah, blah, blah. So I, I think your, your, uh, your uh, interpretation of the, 
of the parsing of those phrases is, is quite right. And I don't think the, the further articulation with respect to it has made, uh, has, has offered a clear answer to your question. Sir, uh, Hank Melanowski from the Marine Corps. Just a quick question. Uh, can you give me your crystal ball view of uh, Iran and uh, where the future lies with uh, Israel in, in that regard? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm going to get in, tr in more trouble. I've already uh, uh, told my views about North Korea, and Chris Hill is going to send me an email tonight, I'm sure, saying, wait a minute. Uh, so, Iran. Uh, Iran I illustrates uh, the fact that uh, both President Bush and now President Obama are dealing with extremely difficult uh, issues, extremely difficult adversaries, in which the U.S. has uh, quite limited means to change behaviors. Uh, and that's hard for Americans to agree, because. Uh, so usually then we say, well, we'll just state the objectives that we have. And if we state them over two or three times, we hope that uh, they might be realized. But in any case, if they're not realized, we at least said what we wanted. And actually, in most of the strategy talk, uh, there's a huge confusion between objectives and the organization of ways and means to achieve the objectives. So in the Iranian case, uh, today, they have gone across six uh, bright red lines that Israel said they would never be allowed to cross, including the most important and brightest of the red lines, which is mastering the technology to enrich uranium. So they can indigenously manufacture centrifuges that enrich uranium, uh, and they can enrich uranium to 4 or 5%, which is what they're doing now. And anybody that can do that can repipe the centrifuges and enrich it to 90%, and that's what you need for a bomb. So today, Iran has two bombs worth of LEU if further enriched. Uh, that is, if, if further uh, enriched, the 4,400 4, pounds or so of low enriched uranium they have would produce stuff for two bombs. Uh, and they're doing another, I think the IAEA did another report today. I think they've now stepped up a little bit. They're doing about eight pounds a day. So every day, there's eight more pounds of low-enriched uranium uh, in Iran. Um, the uh, U.S. options are not good. Uh, and uh, there'll be another round of U.N. Security Council resolution. There'll be another round of sanctions. And it's meant to be targeting the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, my bet is it'll have about the same impact as the last five UN Security Council resolutions and three rounds of sanctions. Uh, that is nothing material with respect to the progress of the Iranian nuclear program. The Israelis then will get excited at some point, and they get excited from time to time, which seems to do more with the internal politics of Israel than of the external development, since the as I say, I, you've watched them go across the bright lines. Uh, Netanyahu is calling for crippling sanctions. Uh, but if you look at what means crippling sanctions and ask, how are you going to get a UN Security Council resolution in favor of that, and ask, was well, China going to be in favor of it? The answer is no, they're not. So if you map, actually I had a, a, a research assistant graph uh, the strength of sanctions and Chinese trade with Iran, and there are two parallel lines, both continuing uh, up uh, precisely. And uh, at Davos, I was talking to a Chinese uh, fellow, uh, and he said he was very much in favor of another round of sanctions, even though he was not sure China was going to vote for them, but that, uh, and that he called it trade promotion, uh, <laughs> because every time the, the the Europeans dropped an agreement with the Chinese, I mean, sorry, with the Iranians. The Chinese came and picked it up at a better, at a better price. Uh, so I, I would say this one is very hard. Will the Israelis attack? Uh, and they, I'd say if they felt comfortable that they had identified all the targets, uh, I suspect they would. 
biggest uh, drawback to a military option has always been that you can't destroy anything you haven't identified. And is Natanz and Qom the whole program? I would say it's possible. I know some people in the American government who believe that's right. Uh, I, I would, I, when I think about the Iranian nuclear program manager, uh, he's going to put all of his eggs in the two baskets, one of which is under the Klieg lights? I don't think so. So I think there are other, other secret facilities. I think that's the big drawback. Oh, I would say stay tuned, yeah. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Goldner, U.S. Army, did the determination that Afghanistan was not a national interest between 1990 and 2001 inadvertently undermine the vital national interest of security because of the development of al-Qaeda? So by creating vacuums that can be filled is that a significant risk that we run in pursuit of your philosophy on pursuing national interest? Very, very good question. And again, uh, I'm, I'm being very, uh, I mean, particularly since we're having to do brief answers, these are a little more, uh, I mean, everything's got many more shades to it. And I'd say about many of these things, I'm more, uh, I could give you the other side of the argument, more conflicted than it'll appear. But I'd say, what's wrong with that argument? Just, uh, uh, and I think it, it reflects uh, what I think is a confusion in the culture about the terrorist threat, which confuses terrorists and territory. Okay. So uh, did the U.S. make huge mistakes in Afghanistan uh, when al-Qaeda set up training camps there. And huge mistakes after al-Qaeda had declared war on the U.S. So that's 1996, okay, so they would declare war. They attack us at the uh, World Trade Center in 93. They then attack the two embassies in uh, Africa. Then they attack the warship Cole. And they got a training camp there that we can have a picture of. You can, even by then, you could go to Google and see. Okay. Uh, and what did we do? Damn all. Okay. So I would say shame on us. Okay. But that wasn't, wasn't the fact that there was a, a Taliban regime. The Taliban regime in, in, in Afghanistan was terrible. Okay. Terrible to the people of Pakistan. Terrible to those statues which they defaced. Terrible guys. But there's a lot of terrible regimes in the world. What was the problem? The problem was there was a sanctuary for al-Qaeda. And I would say, what prevented us going and getting them? Shame on us. That would be my view. Okay. So the failure wasn't with respect to uh, vital interests in Afghanistan. The vital interest, the thing that should, be, should have been recognized to us as a, as a threat to our vital interests, was this group called Al-Qaeda and their headquarters and organization and planning and, and training exercise. So if they set up in Bonn or in Hamburg, we should be about rooting them out of Hamburg. Okay? If they set up in Yemen, we should be after them in Yemen. If they happen to be in Somalia, we should be after them in Somalia. But there's a huge amount of ungoverned spaces in the world. I mean, whenever I map it, it's like, you know, 40 or 50. So are all of those terrible places for human beings to live? They are. They're horrible, okay? And do horrible things happen there? Yes, they do. And are they places where Al-Qaeda might be? Yes, they are. But Al-Qaeda might be also in Hamburg. So I would say, in my view, the simple version of it is focus on the terrorists more than on the territory. Peter Scharfman, Mitre Corporation. Uh, I wonder why the commission did not identify as an interest in one of the categories the, a consistent thread through American history of seeking access to the rest of the world for our trade, both access to things we want to buy and, and the ability to sell things, access for our ideas, 
freedom for Americans to travel where they please? It's a good, good question, and I think uh, in, the, in the list of the global systems that we think are vital for American interests includes the open global trading system. So we were quite sympathetic to the proposition that the, the open uh, global trading system like the global financial system have become conditions that are now necessary or nearly necessary for survival and well-being of U.S. So the answer is basically yes. Um, as your host, I'd like to exert the prerogative to ask the last question, but before I do that, um, I'd like to in some ways th thank Dr. A Allison, but on the other hand apologize to them, because in my opinion, there is no harder question to ask somebody than what are U.S. national interests? Because uh, we all think it's an easy question to answer, but as, as the doctor has pointed out in his presentation, how do you categorize them? How do you separate them? How do you prioritize them? Is not an easy thing to do, especially when you've got to get them down to a few. Or as some of your questions have pointed out, how do you get them down to a few that me are meaning? and not so superficial that they really don't mean a darn thing. So, how, and then how do you operationalize them? And, and this is an extremely hard thing, and one of the reasons why we wanted to bring in one of the foremost thinkers in, in U.S. policy for the past 30, 40 years and, and, and give it a shot. So, my last question, if I may, and I'd like to go back to national interest. One of the things, especially by the realist school that is often touted is, the basic national interest of every state is survival. My question, on the other hand, is, is there any U.S. national interest or set of interests, in your opinion, that override the survival aspect or priority? Are there any national interests in which we would give up the existence of the Uni United States? We knew that back in the Cold War, perhaps, in terms of mutual assured destruction, if it ever occurred. Maybe we would blow up the country, you know, as as a foreign alternative. Do you see any any of those today? Well, it's a very uh, well uh, tough question. Uh, I, I'm a, uh, I mean, when I I was I was doing a class this week at Harvard for some uh, national security crowd from the uh, Middle East, uh, from the UAE and otherwise, and I always say that such groups. Uh, let me confess to, to, to begin with that I'm a very uh, ethnocentric American. So, uh, and I find that I try to put my people, myself in other people's shoes, and I try to recognize there's six and a half billion people in the world, and only 300 million of them are Americans. But in any case, so I start from a pretty narrow-minded uh, American perspective, and. So I find it, uh, I always found during the Cold War that the debate about red or dead was a hard one. And you put it just right in, the, in mutual assured destruction. So what? Okay, so I remember working through this with Weinberger once up in Maine. Okay, so here, the, for whatever reason, there's been 20 or 30 or 40 bombs that went off in the U.S., nuclear weapons. And that many people killed. Is it time now for Armageddon in which we kill everybody? We kill all the Russians, but we suspect that they'll kill all of us by the time we're done. You think, yo. No, I don't think a, a president, most presidents never finally made that decision. And Kissinger actually has a... Uh, uh, who's been thinking about this a lot lately in the context of this Four Horsemen thing, has a very uh, uh, extremely thoughtful uh, discussion of uh, the fact that he would think about this a lot and was never sure in his own mind what he would advise a president if he were asked under such conditions. So you think, well, I mean, I always, as a first approximation, think, okay, yes, if we kill all the Russians, that's okay. Uh, but how about if the consequence of that is 
we kill all the Americans at the same time. Well, that's like a mutual suicide pact. That seems pretty crazy. Uh, on the other hand, you're going to let 10 or 20 million Americans have died and you're not going to do something? No, you're not going to do that. So it was always, that's a problem from hell. I, I think in the, in the current situation, I can't think of the analogous uh, a threat. Uh, and I think there's a huge amount of faults with the U.S. Uh, and I think we disappoint uh, ourselves and the rest of the world uh, greatly, uh, frequently. But I think if I ask myself, uh, how about China rules? Are we or the rest of the world going to like living in a China-dominated world better? It's going to be more prosperous or more decent or more reasonable? Or I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. So then what about some other candidate? So I, I, don't, I'm, I think that we sometimes are presumptuous or pretentious when we say America is the only great uh, hope. But I, I, I would still say relative to the competitors so far, it's hard to think of some uh, better. So I, I would, I can't, I, I can't think of any uh, thing for which I would uh, give up uh, the U.S. and its institutions and values. Yeah. Please join with me in thanking Dr. Allison for a tremendous presentation.